Awesome, cool. So my name is Ricky Vetter, and today we're going to talk a little bit about React and WebGL. Um, as a quick preface, I'm sure that you guys are hoping to see a lot of really cool uh, 3D examples and awesome animations, and I'm sorry to disappoint, but you're not going to get any of that. Um, hopefully it'll still be interesting, though. So a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm an engineer at Social Tables. I'm also an organizer of React DC. Um, that's what I look like. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, we're going to provide a little bit of context for why I'm talking about this and um, maybe why I won't be giving you any fancy 3D animations. Uh, then we're going to go a little bit into what WebGL is, because I'm assuming most of you know more about what React is than what WebGL is. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the similarities between WebGL and React, uh, a little bit about their differences, and then how they can be used together. So it's a little bit of context. Um, I work for a company called Social Tables. It's an events and hospitality company. We do a lot of things, but one of our main products is diagramming software. Uh, this is a screenshot of our application, and basically what it does is it allows venues and event planners to collaborate and be able to sort of define uh, an event space uh, before the actual event takes place. So uh, people use this for anything from like a really boring uh, theater layout, like what you're in today, to like this really crazy party that looks like confetti uh, when you're looking at it above from the sky. Um, so we have to handle sort of like a lot of different use cases and a lot of different uh, elements on the screen. Until very recently, our production app uh, was built on Knockout uh, with SVG using to render things. Um, it worked really well, had some really nice uh, smooth animations, uh, but it had a really big flaw. Um, basically, there was a hard limitation at uh, 200 objects. So once you got more than 200 objects on the floor, uh, the user experience would start to be really shaky. Like The re-renders would be really slow. Uh, and it, and it started to really degrade user experience. After about 500 objects, it became like completely unusable. Um, so me and a team uh, started doing some R&D projects to see what we could do to sort of improve that. Um, originally, we, we started by saying, okay, like this knockout was written pretty early on in uh, the company's uh, history, and we're not sure about like the stability of the code, and like there might be some pretty bad memory leaks that are happening, and um, we don't really like Knockout at all, so uh, we ended up uh, rewriting like a much simpler version in React to see what kind of improvements we would have. And there were definite improvements, but uh, not anywhere near what we were looking for to be able to accommodate these big like convention centers that we really wanted to work with. Um, so we also then tried working, uh, switching the SVG to uh, rendering in WebGL, and that actually like increased the performance like amazingly well because we don't have to handle all of these extra DOM nodes and all of this extra. Um, weight that the DOM brings with it, uh, and actually gets us to uh, 5,000 objects is now like where the uh, limit of like user experience starts to get degraded, and we can go all the way to like 10,000 with still like a basically usable product, which is really sweet for us. Um, but it sort of required that combination of switch to React to do all of the Chrome and, and UI work, and switch to WebGL to render the actual canvas part of things. Um, so the reason that I can't show you any cool 3D examples is because I'm not actually a 3D engineer in any way. Like this is what we're rendering in WebGL, so, th so we're only working with like 2D shapes right now. So uh, even though like it looks exactly like an SVG would look, uh, this is actually being rendered in WebGL. Um, so s sorry I don't have any like cool video games. Um, so a little bit about like what WebGL is. Uh, it stands for Web Graphics Library. And it's basically a Java API that wraps around, or sorry, a JavaScript API, wow, uh, that wraps around OpenGL um, and works with OpenGL. And basically, you can think of it as like a pure function that takes uh, geometries, textures, and shaders and turns it into pixels that are going to appear on your screen uh, within a canvas element. Uh, so what does that actually mean for us? Um, it means that once we start working in WebGL, we're going to be leaving the world of DOM. So uh, we're not going to have a lot of the really fancy interaction capabilities and the fancy positioning qualities that the DOM provides for us, um, we're going to be reaching much more low level into how a computer actually like, animates things. Um, it also means that we are going to have to manage our own rendering system, which I'll talk about a little bit more in detail later. Um, so what does that mean for us? It means that we get a powerful 3D graphics library uh, that's native on the web which is one great use case for using WebGL over the DOM. And then there's our use case, which is the DOM just doesn't provide the performance profile that we really need. Um, so we're going to use it, even though it might not be 
the right tool for the job. It is the best tool for the job in our case. Um, so let's just take a quick look at a little bit of code. I hope that's big enough for you guys to read. Um, basically, this is just comparing like a really simple version of a render function in WebGL with uh, what you're used to seeing a render function in uh, React. Um, and we're going to sort of break that down and look at what's similar between the two and what's different between the two. So we'll start with the similarities. And the first similarity that we have is that they're both like completely view-centric technologies. They don't really care where your state comes from. Uh, they don't handle like, manipulation of state. Like, you're going to have to use something else for all of that sort of management. Um, they basically just take the data that you want to render, and they turn it into the, into the pixels on the screen. Um, you can see that here. Uh, they both typically use a render function in order to be able to draw their thing, to draw what they're trying to draw. Um, then you can also see uh, that by using the word render, um, they're signifying that they're not like manually tweaking things, that they both sort of follow the philosophy of re-render everything on the screen uh, first and then optimize. Um, but something that's different for WebGL than React is that WebGL doesn't really give you the option to uh, conditionally re-render things. It's always a complete re-render. Uh, you always give it all of the data that it needs to render every single pixel, and then the shader logic gets run on every single point in your scene um, and every single pixel in the screen, and then it redraws every single one. Um, there's really sort of no half measure, no should component update in WebGL. Um, so what other differences are there? Uh, the first one that um, is really noticeable is batching. So React takes care of batching for you. Uh, by default, it uses set timeout um, and allows sort of once a first change gets made, it triggers a set timeout and catches all of the changes uh, that happen up until that point and then uh, applies all of those changes to the DOM at the same time, basically. Um, WebGL doesn't sort of uh, give you any, any default. It comes with the API uh, request animation frame, which allows you to um, take the next like, best time in order to render all of these pixels. Uh, but it doesn't actually enforce that you use that. You can render WebGL on a set timeout, or you can render it as soon as you get every single change, if you feel like. So uh, there's definitely a difference of control there. Um, so you can see that there's extra information added into the uh, WebGL render cycle that uh, you sort of have to manually put in in order to request that re-render. Um, then also, the biggest difference uh, between the two is really the target. Um, React, up until very recently, targets uh, exclusively the DOM. Um, basically, if uh, you're working in React, you're probably using JSX, and you're using something that's DOM-like in uh, its description and its uh, look and feel. Um, and that's just not the case with uh, 3D. In 3D, you're working with pixels, and you're working with polygons, um, specifically different triangles, and you're trying to sort of um, put all of these together to create like one cohesive uh, image. And so you can really see that here um, in that uh, you're sort of drawing your, all of your polygons in the uh, WebGL cycle, um, and you're actually like providing your JSX, which will turn into DOM in your uh, React render cycle. Um, and you can see that a little bit more clearly if you see a little bit of the extra boilerplate that goes into writing a WebGL app, where uh, you're actually drawing the polygons into sort of a canvas context, right? So there are a few, few different ways to get uh, React and WebGL to work together nicely. Um, there is sort of this uh, first initial state, which is actually how uh, the application at Social Tables works right now, which is where you have a side-by-side. -side. Um, and that's basically where you have state that is independently talking to React and to WebGL. Um, probably through a library of some sort, unless you really like to write raw WebGL code. Um, in our case, it's using 3.js. Uh, so you have state talking to these two different places, and then they independently render to the places that they are in control of. Um, so for us, this works really well, and it was really quick to set up. Um, obviously, you basically just, in React, you set aside a canvas element that you're just not going to touch. Um, and then you let WebGL sort of own that canvas element. And it works really nicely and is really, really fast to set up. Uh, there are some really uh, tricky problems with it, especially if you use uh, 3.js. And that 3.js is a very jQuery-like imperative API. And React is a very declarative API. And so 
your communication from state to React and state to WebGL is going to be very different. Um, you're going to be uh, communicating entire state to React while you're going to be communi communicating updates, uh, adds, and deletes to WebGL. Um, we've sort of written a wrapper around that that makes it really easy. Uh, you don't have to think about it, like, except for the, when the wrapper was actually written, but it's still a pain to have to write, and it's probably going to be a pain to maintain. Um, sort of the next uh, level of, of interaction between the two is to do it with an integration. So here you have a state that's just talking to React, um, and then React talks independently to a uh, WebGL library, and then it renders to both the DOM and the canvas. So basically what this means is that you have uh, this same wrapper around uh, WebGL library that gets bumped over so that you can use it underneath React, um, and you don't really have to think about that information. So uh, the writer of that library has abstracted it away and made it so that you can treat WebGL as if it is React and, and write JSX and, and have uh, WebGL come out the other side. Uh, there are some really good examples of this in the community. Um, React 3 and React Pixie are probably the two most popular examples of this. Uh, you can also see like React Canvas is doing something really similar with Canvas as opposed to WebGL. Um, and then uh, it, it, it works really well. Um, it's, it's really clean and it means that you sort of get to abstract that away and not think about the, the really in-depth WebGL code. Um, but there is still a problem with this in that uh, now you have this wrapper around the wrapper where, where you have React and 3 uh, or your WebGL library of choice uh, on the page at the same time. And both of them are relatively big libraries and both of them are really opinionated about how they do things. And so uh, you have a lot of extra weight and um, you also have some differences of opinion that, allow you, that don't allow you to uh, have the full flexibility of, of WebGL in the way that you really want, want it. So um, there are use cases where React 3 uh, has a really hard time doing like certain really specific things with WebGL that you could do really easily if you weren't constrained by having to communicate with WebGL through uh, React through 3, basically. Um, it also runs into some issues with the differences in how they batch. Uh, like I said, React by default uses a set timeout in order to batch their updates. Um, and uh, WebGL runs much smoother if you're batching your updates on a request animation frame, um, because that's like the optimized point in order to actually do these uh, pixel calculations. So um, you can run into like some slight timing issues and some smoothness of animation issues occasionally. So uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about how uh, there really is sort of a better solution and that is the like, React native uh, solution. So there was a blog post that came out with React 0.14 uh, where they specifically mention uh, a sort of two packages that, that are now going to be released. So uh, looking at packages like React Native and like React Canvas and React 3, um, it says here that it, it became pretty clear that the beauty and essence of React has nothing to do with browsers uh, or the DOM. And that's, that's really true. Um, and in order to make that more clear, as of React about 14, React is now being delivered in two different packages. So there's React, which is like the core uh, diffing algorithm and, and a bunch of the, the necessities of the render cycle uh, that React has. And then there's React DOM, which is all of the things that are specific to uh, DOM updates. So uh, to give an example of how this tree looks like, uh, you have state that's talking to React, which then talks to uh, React DOM or React WebGL. Um, you could also think of this as kind of reversed, where React DOM wraps uh, React, and React WebGL also wraps Re React. Um, and then those talk to their respective components. Um, this gets rid of sort of the idea of um, needing two different libraries. So if, if React in its declarative API can wrap the WebGL API directly, uh, you don't sort of have that um, shift in ideologies and difficulty communicating what you're trying to do in WebGL in the same way. Um, it also lifts all that extra weight of the um, library and uh, theoretically you can be more in control of the batching process because you don't have to communicate through uh, two different libraries. So you can change the batching project, uh, the batching process in React to follow a more request animation frame update cycle. And then uh, you'll get that sort of performance with this that you want out of the WebGL. 
Um, the, the cons here are really that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, the separation of React uh, from React DOM is um, still not as nice as it could be. They're, they're not like completely separate entities in the way that uh, it would make it really easy to write something that can replace React DOM. Um, and the code is really dense, so it's really difficult to figure out exactly what you need to implement in order to implement something that does what React DOM does, but targets a completely different sort of visual interface. Um, also, there's a little bit of issue with the batching strategy as well. Um, there's also some pretty big hurdles here on the WebGL side, just as far as uh, debugging and, and testing your code. So uh, once you leave that world of DOM, you don't have a lot of the really niceties of like the Chrome Dev tools and being able to um, understand really clearly what's happening to the visual display on your screen, right? You just have a series of pixels, and, and it really becomes uh, much more based on your eyes and like looking at the screen to make sure that things are right, which, quite frankly, for a lot of applications, isn't worth like leaving the DOM for. Like, you have to really, really need the performance, or you have to really be needing to render things in 3D to make it worth not having that testing or debugging. Um, so really, what I'm here to say is uh, that we should be uh, still experimenting and, and writing cool libraries like React 3 um, and React Canvas where, where we're targeting new things. I mean, there are things outside of the web that we can target with React and be able to render to uh, really easily. And then there are things like uh, Peter was showing just before this, like you're writing the interface for the audio in React, like maybe we can one day like render the audio in React and, and target like um, audio APIs as opposed to visual APIs to be able to render things. Um, and then there are tons of experiments that that we can still play around with and try and sort of hack together um, that are, are really exciting and a really cool sort of ecosystem to be a part of. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, CT and Matthew, who were the two coworkers that uh, work on these sort of R&D projects with me and, and was able to, uh, CT especially, help me understand how WebGL works and how 3D works. Um, I hope that I've explained in enough depth what all uh, I'm talking about, but feel free to ask me questions on Slack or Twitter um, after this. And uh, thank you very much.